Please remain standing for the reading of the gospel. As we look at the Bible's greatest prayers, we turn to Jesus at the Last Supper from John 17, 20 through 26. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me because of their testimony. My prayer for all of them is that they will be one just as you and I are one, Father. That just as you are in me and I am in you, so they will be in us, and the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, so that they may be one as we are. I in them and you in me, all being perfected into one. Then the world will know that you sent me, and will understand that you love them as much as you love me. Father, I want these whom you've given me to be with me so they can see my glory. You gave me the glory because you loved me even before the world began. O oh, righteous Father, the world doesn't know you, but I do. And these disciples know that you sent me, and I have revealed you to them and will keep on revealing you. I will do this so that your love for me may be in them and I in them. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. As we look at the Bible's greatest prayers, we must come to this one early. Prayer has been called the Christian's vital breath, a longing of the soul, the mightiest force in the world. So if you turn to the Gospel of John, starting at the, 11, at the 13th chapter through the 17th chapter, you're going to get what's called Jesus' final discourse, his final words, his final thoughts, his final love comments to his disciples before he would be betrayed and go to the cross. It begins with action words as he took the basin and the towel. And then he gives them a new commandment that you should love one another as I have loved you. He will give, you, give us these beautiful words that I am the way, the truth, and the life and then he would say that I am the vine, and you are the branches. And apart from me, you can do nothing. And he would say that there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. And he said, now I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. All of that culminates in this prayer from John 17, a plea from the depths of the soul of Jesus. It was a yearning, a cry for unity, that we might be one. This will be one of the most important sermons I will ever share with you. Let us pray. So out of the depths of who we are, Lord, let us live and understand, live into this prayer. It has amazing repercussions for our church, for our families, and for the world. That's why you spoke it. Amen. I've shared with you before that if you look at Scripture closely, when something repeats itself, it's highly significant. So if you look at this prayer, and if you even back up a few verses to verse 11, so look at it from verse 11 to verse 23, not once, not twice, not three times, but four times, Jesus pleads that we may be one. In fact, 
the last time he says it, just to punctuate it that much more, he says that we may be completely one or be perfected in one so that the world might know the heart of the Father, might bear witness to his perfect love, this agape love God has for each one of us and that we might have for one another. John Chrysostom, the late 4th century bishop of Constantinople, said just 300 years or thereabouts after Jesus' death, he said if disciples, if believers, would but keep the peace among themselves that they learn from Jesus, the people around them would know the teacher by his disciples. God would model it in this almost incomprehensible love of the Godhead itself, the Trinity, the seamless, perfect love of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Perfect harmony. Yet I don't think this gut-wrenching prayer has necessarily fallen on deaf ears over all of the centuries since it was first given, some 2,000 years. But it's been so hard to enact, so hard to bring about, so hard to model in our families and in our personal lives and within the body of Christ, within the church. Listen to how the church began in its very, very infant stage. If you look to the second chapter of Acts, and a lot of you have heard these words, beginning in verse 44, it says that all who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all, as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. It's still the right formula. It's still the right model. But again, oh, so hard to implement. It didn't play out that way very long when Jesus gave those words in 33 A.D. All of Paul's letters were a testament to how it didn't play out very well, how there was faction and uh, strife within the early church. And today there's never been more fragmentation, more of a lack of harmony in our witness um, and it confuses the world uh, as they try to know of God our Father by the actions of Christ's believers, his disciples. Do you know that it's been estimated, as, cl as close as we can track it, that there are over 41,000 Christian denominations in the world today. 41,000. How does that happen? Uh, just look at our own United Methodist Church. When we brought Methodism into this new world of the United States of America, uh, we were the predominant denomination but listen to all of the denominations that have spun off from Methodism. All of the holiness churches. All of the Pentecostal churches. All of the Nazarene churches. The United Church of Christ. The Salvation Army. The American or the African Methodist Episcopal Church. The Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. The, all the pilgrim holiness churches churches, the Wesleyan church, and it goes on and on and on. That's just within Methodism. And the United Methodist Church was the last church that tried 
to bring about a, a, a merger uh, to kind of bring some of these churches back together it was in 1968 that we brought the Evangelical United Brethren Church and the Methodist Episcopal Church together to form the United Methodist Church that we are today. And that's been the last major denominational merger almost 50 years ago. Uh, this week I'll be up at Chautauqua in New York, the original Chautauqua. It's a beautiful setting where people of all faiths gather and some of the greatest preaching that the world ever hears is at Chautauqua. And there's a Methodist house and there's a Lutheran house and there's a Baptist house and there's a Presbyterian house and there is a Buddhist house and is an Islamic house. I had the pleasure one time of being the chaplain of the week at the Methodist house. And I, there's great pride that I feel when I go to our Methodist house. But friends, there ain't going to be no Methodist house in heaven. Right. There's not going to be a Baptist house in heaven sure. or any other denominational house. 41,000 denominations and probably still counting. How does it happen? We have disagreement over interpretation of Scripture. We argue and fight over whether Scripture is infallible or inerrant, without error, whether we should interpret it liberally or literally. We fight over baptism and how we should do baptism. We fight over Holy Communion. Not so much whether we should do it, but how we do it. We have all of these doctrinal beliefs, these laws. Um, we fight and we separate over race. And we did, that's what caused the initial splits in the United Methodist Church, is that we held on to slavery too long. We fight over the role of women and over who should be ordained. And we still fight over things like that. We fight over all kinds of social issues. So today, we fight over abortion and homosexuality and the death penalty and on and on. We fight over the words that are to be said and how you become saved. In the last community I was in, there was one church that said, you got to say these actual words or you won't be saved. And the, another church said, no, it's these words and if you don't say these words, you aren't really saved. If you, if you go from our church into a lot of churches, they won't honor our baptism. So the church just continues to splinter. And the results, according to the Hartford Institute of Religious Research, more than 40% of Americans say they go to church weekly. But it actually turns out that only about 20% go to church weekly. We call that the halo effect. People, when you're reporting, they say things they wish they would do, but they really aren't doing it. The mainline church has been in a state of decline in terms of attendance for at least 30 years. And yet most people will say that they believe in God, or at least in a universal Spirit. And at our annual conference just a couple of weeks ago, Bishop Palmer was, was agonizing over the nuns or the zeros in our statistic, statistics. The, the churches in our conference without any baptisms last year, without any professions of faith, the nuns, without any new members coming into the church. At the end of 2013, the West Ohio Conference had 1,038 local churches. It's one of the largest conferences in the world. But it's still down from where it was uh, several years ago. We are closing a lot of churches too. Of that number, 44% or 454 of our churches baptized no one in 
2013. And 51% or 528 of these had zero professions of faith. Those are the nuns. Wow. But we fight over all these points that we hold so sacred. We just said the Apostles' Creed. People fight over the Apostles' Creed because they don't want to believe in everything that it says. Well, that keeps people out of the church, friends, because if the church can't be united, and it starts within, we don't have to look any further than our own United Methodist Church. I came from an area, a community called Lewisburg. The United Methodist Church was the church that helped find the West and the Western states, and they, they were part of this major movement, West. So you won't find many churches or many communities in this country that doesn't have a United Methodist Church. But what happens is you, in a lot of these communities, you find, a, you find two United Methodist churches, sometimes almost within a stone's throw of each other, because almost 50 years later, we, even though we're united, we can't bring two churches in sometimes small communities together. In Lewisburg, Ohio, that's what I found myself in when I first went in 1999 into that community. They were within four blocks of one another. They shared families. Half the family would go to one church. Half the family would go to another church. They did social things together. It's a small community. They would party together. They would have picnics together. But don't mess with their churches because they wanted to stay separate. Because what had become too important were the pews. And also what happened in those pews. You know, they had a lot of beautiful memories of baptisms and weddings and deaths and professions of faith. And they wouldn't want to give them up. So the one church would say to the other, not only in Lewisburg, but throughout the country, after the merger, yeah, we can come together. You come into my church. And the other church would say, no, 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 I got a better idea. You come into my church. And they stayed separate. And what kind of a witness is that to the community? And what happens over the years is, is they decline because they tend to become pretty parochial and almost cliquish, and, and they become these closed families. So you wonder, how do you have 41,000 different denominations? Well, you don't have to look too far when you see these examples. So, some of you have heard me share part of this story. You know how much I love our mission to Belize, and... Some of you have told me some of your most beautiful experiences of Christianity is when you were in an ecumenical setting, that you went to a service or you went to a gathering where people from all these denominations were together, and for an hour you worshiped as one, and you put aside all of the differences, and you said it was so liberating well there was several uh, several years ago a time where when we went to Belize we had uh, in our our team people from we counted 10 different denominations and one who didn't claim any denomination and that week we let go of everything that separate us. My word, we had Pentecostals on the one hand and Roman Catholics on the other. And we were one. And I want to tell you, it was the most beautiful thing in the world. And on the, that year, I remember, on our last day, we always try to gather our team together for a celebration of the time we've been uh, down there and all the things we've done in, in Christ's name. And we were at a fellow's na house by the name of Urbano Compost. And there must have been 75 or 100 of us that were there. And 
we, there was singing and dancing and testimony, both from our team members and from the local people, and that we were all, all praising God. And one of the things that I always do when I'm leading it is I always have a time of holy communion. And remember, communion separates us usually. There are places we aren't allowed to take communion, or we argue as to what kind of bread to give or what kind of drink to offer um, and, and who, who's worthy of coming forward and, or who's a member of that congregation. But down there, even though we had Roman Catholics and, and Protestants, everybody comes to the table. And this particular time, I usually have people come forward as we do and through intinction we, um, we take the Lord's Supper. But that day I decided there were so many of us, um, I decided I would have everybody serve each other. So I had a cup and a plate for one end to start and a cup and a plate for the other end. And as after I had blessed the elements and we had started this time of communion, all of a sudden it hit me that Rick was going to be served communion. Now Rick is a fallen away Roman Catholic who at the time claimed that he was an atheist. And he was very bitter toward the church. And I ached after I had started it because I want to try to make everything as inclusive as possible, offending no one, but yet not compromising your faith either. And I thought, well, if I would have had them come forward, then Rick would have had the choice as to whether he could have come or not. But now the cup and the plate's going to be passed to him. What's he going to do with it? So I prayed and watched. And the cup and the plate come to Rick, and he just smiles. And he received the bread and the cup and then he turned to his neighbor and he said, this is the body of Christ for you. This is the blood of Christ for you. And he smiled. Rick and I have become very close over the years. And recently he was leaving his home and relocating out of the Delaware area. And we went to a a celebration of his life and he came up to me he was so glad I came he didn't think I would come and he and he put his arms around me he's done this so many times he said Mike brother Mike I love you I may not agree with everything that you say but I love you that's what is the prayer of Jesus in John 17 Unity and harmony doesn't mean we have to agree with every, each other on every point. In fact, I think it's quite healthy to dis disagree with each other and have good dialogue over it. But don't leave and don't get angry and don't have schism behind it. Listen to the other person. That's a mark of love. If we would do that, what a witness we would be to the world today and to our own country that can't talk to one another. We need to be able to talk to one another in the church. And I think we do that well here at Bethel International Church. And you know what's helped us do that, in my opinion? Are the children. The little children. You look into the eyes of those little ones and you see nothing but love and, and reflections of who the Lord is and anything that we had that might separate us, it just kind of melts away, doesn't it? Didn't you love to see in those pictures that Jenny showed us all of these children of different hues and religious, or, 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 or uh, not necessarily religious backgrounds, although I'm sure there were different religious backgrounds, but uh, country backgrounds. Uh, I loved a picture of all the feet that were in and the different colors of the feet that were in that circle. Uh, and it just made us feel so good because we were united in love. 
And I'm gonna tell you that's what should happen in families because too many families separate and won't talk to each other and they're, and they're splintering because of, of issues they just hang on to that they think are so important. And in the end, friends, and as you get older, you can give testament to, the, to it. It doesn't really matter, does it? The things that you hold on to, does it really, really matter? Aren't they all the small stuff that we sweat? Isn't it more important that a family member really feels your love and that you, you accept them? Uh, we'll work out the differences in, in ways where sometimes you just agree to disagree in love. That's an expression that we have in the United Methodist Church. May we be a beacon of that here at Bethel because Brother Milton started a prayer with us for this service by quoting the 133rd Psalm, Milton, when you said, how good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. The psalmist goes on to say, it is like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. All of these beautiful descriptions of what it means to be unified. We can stand together as the most liberal of people and the most conservative people, of those who want to believe that the Bible is the inerrant word of God and those who say that the Bible is the inspired word of God. We can believe, we can love each other whether we're baptized by immersion or by sprinkling. We can, bat, we can learn to love one another whether we take the one, a cup, whether it has alcohol in it or whether it has grape juice in it. We can love one another whether we're a member of this church or whether we're not a member of this church. And we can love somebody whether they accept Jesus Christ or whether they don't accept Jesus Christ. Because if they want to know who Christ is, if they want to know who the Master is, they need to look at us and to see the Master in us. And it's only going to be our love and our unity that will convey that. There is no more important message, friends, than that. And I want to compliment you because you're doing a pretty good job of it. A pretty good job. Let us pray. Lord, give us strength to hear your prayer and to live it. doesn't mean that we are letting go of principles. It just means that we are finding you. Teach us again that the ethic of love supersedes everything else. And that may we start by loving you with all of our heart and soul and strength and mind and loving all the things you've taught us to do. Which means loving our neighbor, whoever that neighbor is, as ourself. Amen.